Hi, I'm Jackie Flavin, Customer Insights Leader with Demco, and this is Open Book, our weekly conversation series with industry experts about how they're navigating COVID-19 challenges. Today, I am joined by Kathy Wolkoff and Tanya Elias um, from Madison Public Library. We are so grateful to have them here today. They have started a really innovative program um, giving out CSA style book bundles to patrons at curbside pickup. So really cool idea, especially um, these pandemic days. And we're going to dive into um, how they came up with that and, and how they make it work. So maybe as a starting point, um, can you, um, either one of you, can you share um, maybe a little bit about how, you know, Madison Public Library is operating during the pandemic? How many, how many branches are open and, and that sort of thing? Sure, so we have nine libraries and a Dream Bus, uh, which is like a small bookmobile. Um, currently, all nine libraries are providing curbside um, pickup and return. So that's uh, services happening outside of the building. And then eight of our nine libraries are doing in-person appointment only computer appointments. One of our libraries is uh, a little less than 3,000 square feet and we aren't able to safely operate both in-person computing and curbside out of that location. And then our Dream Bus um, is visiting 16 community sites every week in the summer. Um, those are coordinated with the Madison Metropolitan School District. So we're going to summer meal sites around the city and giving out books and signing um, kids and families up for library cards. So um, in terms of the programs and services that we're offering, we are doing um, curbside pickup and returns. We're doing telephone and email reference. Uh, we're doing in-person computing by appointment. Uh, with some walk-up service starting, um, and that includes like the ability to print and fax and scan. Um, we are just about to implement wireless printing so people can send print jobs from their phone or their work computer or wherever they are and pick them up at the library. Um, the Dream Boss, like I said, and then we're doing very, very, very limited programming. So um, just a few online events. Um, other than the Dream Boss, we're not doing any in-person programming. Um, but are working with the city of Madison to kind of repurpose either um, some of our staff or some of our facilities. So our central library is hosting monthly blood drives. Um, a lot of our staff have worked on elections mm -hmm. and doing other um, work for the city. Some of our staff were um, deployed to the um, Alliant Energy Testing Center. So uh, helping with like directing traffic at the COVID testing center that we have in our community and then um, doing some in-person absentee voting um, in our libraries or near our libraries, so assisting with that. Wow, yeah. And how, how, has, um, how have patrons responded during the pandemic? I, I, I as a former Madison Public Library patron myself, um, I, I would be so grateful to be, to be your patron right now and, and um, knowing all the effort that you guys are putting into making it, you know, making it happen. Well, I, I think as probably most public libraries will attest, like some customers are really happy that we're doing anything and some customers wish we were doing more. And some customers said, you know, why didn't you do this the day that it closed? <laughs> you know, some people are really happy with what we're doing and some people wish we were doing more. I, would you say that's true, Kathy? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know I, th I was saying to some of my coworkers, we should institute like National Thank Your Librarian Day so that, so that you know, patrons can, can give librarians their appreciation because um, it's well deserved. I'm wondering how is the staff doing? You know, so people, some people have moved around, a lot of people are working from home. How is like the, the morale and staff these days? Honestly, I think we're all really stressed. You know, I, I think the stress might look different whether you're a manager or a frontline employee. They might look different if you're working at home or working in the buildings, but hard, you know, it's hard for everybody. Um, your job has changed completely. The things that you like about your job, like the interactions with, with um, other colleagues or with customers, you're missing a lot of that or, um, you know, the kinds of things that you used to enjoy spending time, you know, in the break room with a colleague, like you can't do that anymore. And mm -hmm. you can't, you know, it's not like we're always touching customers, but like there, there's, there's a like distance, you know, like people step away from you and you step away from other people and it just feels strange. And that's not to mention um, what it's like to have a flexible schedule and, and do teleworking 
when you have two kids at home or, you know, a husband who's sick or all of these other life stresses and all the concerns that you have about just COVID in the community. So, I mean, Kathy and I were just talking before we started about how stressful it all is. And I think it's for everybody in a different way, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, libraries are really on the front lines of this. And I, I've always been so impressed with how adaptable libraries are. I mean, really, almost overnight, I feel like libraries figured out how to get books to people, how to do virtual programming, how to, how to just make it work. And it's hard. It's so hard. Um, and that's why the, the program that you're running, the book bundles really caught my eye. I mean, it's such a great idea. You're, you know, we've all been kind of living through the curbside pickup and then you found a way to, to spice it up and to excite your patrons. Um, can you, so can you tell us like what, what this program is? So I, I, I probably didn't uh, describe it well enough in the beginning. What is, what are we, what is the program look like? Um, so it, it sort of grew out of the whole curbside process. We, um, when we reinstated phone service, we're not, we're not actually doing phone reference service at each location, but we have a centralized um, Zendesk number. So people are doing reference service from their homes, really. And the curbside committee decided that if patrons wanted to place holds on items, that they would call not their pickup location, but that they would call the centralized Zendesk number because they wanted to keep the phones at the locations free for people to arrange their pickup appointments. So we had the centralized number and then the curbside committee decreed that people would be allowed to request three items when they called. And like before we even started, everybody was, you know, kind of up in arms about that. They said, that's an equity issue, like three items, really? These people have been without books for two weeks, you know, two months. <laughs> and if you've got like, you know, three kids at home, you go through, you know, you go through three books in an hour, you know, never mind what you would, you know. So they, they, they just, they felt like that was like, like not a reasonable limit. But it was the intention of it was to protect the time of the phone people so that they wouldn't be stuck on the phone with folks, you know, for an hour trying to place holds. Things were complicated by the fact that we didn't have any delivery service in between our libraries and, you know, we're normally um, very used to not really caring that much about where something is because our delivery service is so good and so robust that if we put it on hold, you've got it in a couple of days. Well, that wasn't going to fly anymore. We needed to get things from the pickup location that people wanted. So how are we going to navigate that when that's not how people were used to, you know, selecting things? And so several of us were just sort of thinking about ways that we could, you know, kind of make this work better. And, you know, somebody, it was not me, um, initially said, well, what if there was a form and people could just say, give me a pile of picture books, you know, and we went, oh, well, that's interesting. So it just kind of evolved from there um, as a way to like let people um, request things if they didn't really have a specific title in mind, but also um, a vehicle for like helping the phone people maybe get off the phone a little bit quicker, you know, that they could take that information about what the patron wanted, dump it into that form, and then um, email staff who were working from, you know, their living room couches um, could then go and place the holds and then make them available at the patron's pickup location. That sounds odd. You're optimizing so many things at once. That is like the golden idea. That is so cool. And it sounds fun to be able to pick up the books based on just a few, you know, um, requests sort of. Or general. Oh my God. It was so fun. And it was also so hard it, it, <laughs> it, it, in equal measure. <laughs> um, yeah. A lot of people, a lot of people sort of felt like, um, they really looked forward to doing the request because they felt like it gave them, you know, sort of like a grounding in, you know, librarianship and right. what we do, you know. Um, I, I personally, I'm actually the um, interlibrary loan librarian and I don't even really do that much reader's advisory anymore. So I was really nervous when the first time it was like my turn to, uh, to handle one of these requests. I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know any books anymore. It's going to be awful. And it was so cool to just be able to like, you know, try to figure out from the little information we had what might be a good fit for people. Um, mm -hmm. But it was incredibly, incredibly time consuming to do, I'm I have sure. to say. So. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, were you able to look at what that patron had checked out before? The, the way we did it, we had them fill out a form and I mean, the original vision for it, at least my original vision for it was just that there would be a pretty low common denominator. 
give me 20 picture books, for example. Somebody thought, and I could see the point, that, well, it might be helpful to know what age we're talking about, or, you know, just tell us, like, one thing that the kid really likes. Like, if they really like trucks, because if you're placing these holds remotely, it's different from just going to the shelf and pulling things off. You need some, you need some sort of hook mm -hmm. if you're searching the catalog. Like, <laughs> mm -hmm. I can't look at every picture book that's at, you know, Branch X. I have to, like, you know, have some search criteria. So that was helpful to have that, but it also... I think sometimes made us um, overthink a little bit because sure. we wanted to give really, really good choices. Yeah. And when people were asking for 40 picture books and many people asked for 40 picture books, we really quickly discovered that, you know, we can't do that in a way that makes any sense from a time management standpoint. You know, we cannot go through and pick 40 really excellent, you know, picture <laughs> books for, for that person. We had to, we had to, you know, genericize it a little bit more just to, you know, get through the volume. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm curious, like, were there any funny requests, like, um, like super specific or were they mostly pretty general? Somebody asked for, for a book, I think it was an adult fiction book from the perspective, written from the perspective of an inanimate object. <laughs> I have no idea how the unlucky librarian who got that one, you know, actually handled it. But yeah, that that would have been that's hilarious. That would have been my personal um, nightmare if I had gotten that one. Yeah. So fortunately, I didn't. <laughs> Was it like a challenge, or do you think they had a specific book in mind? Um, I, I'm not. I don't okay. think they had a specific yeah. book in mind. Um, I had one, it, it was really pretty cool and it was challenging because it was from one of the smaller branches that didn't have as big of a collection. But you know, the person talked pretty extensively about what he wanted and he wanted some science fiction, but he wanted things that sort of pushed the boundaries a little bit. And he didn't want any white, any, let's see, what did he say? No white dudes, please. You know, <laughs> there's, a, there's enough of that. So I'm thinking, okay, we want science fiction from a non-white, non-dude, but it pushes the boundaries. It was like, it was actually a lot, and I, I wound up thinking of like five things that were great for him, but that weren't on the shelf at that particular location. So I did wind up emailing him and saying, you know, here are some things that you might want to consider when delivery is running again. And, you know, here are some things that I got from the shelf. I'm not sure how good the matches are. I'm sure I gave you at least one white dude. I'm sorry, I didn't have a choice. Um, but one thing I gave him, you know, I gave him like um, Kate Atkinson's Life After Life, and it's not really science fiction, but just based on the things he was saying about being willing to kind of push the boundaries, I thought, well, you know, that might fit. Yeah. Who knows if it did, but. Wouldn't you love to trace, like, so that person reads that book that they probably wouldn't have found, and like, where does that take them, you know? That would be so cool to, me to be able to measure that in some way. Yeah. That's so exciting. I love it. Um, I really also, I mean, this is, this really demonstrates like, how awesome libraries are and what you can do for people. I was like, I can almost envision uh, like a public service announcement where we just show you guys going through this process of finding the right folks for the right people, you know, and I'm sure you could have fun with it, um, given all like the, the crazy requests you get. Um, so in 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 it, so you're you're it's still in operation. Have you um, kind of smoothed out the kinks? Is it working pretty well now? Um, well, I think you know the environment has changed, and so it's actually like brought up some new kinks <laughs> that um, we're still kind of running into some snags with. One is that the delivery service is operating now, and so it didn't matter before if we placed a hold from our living room and if it took the pickup location three or four days to actually you know pull it because it wasn't getting trapped at any other location libraries are running their pick lists more now and so sometimes things are getting um you know trapped by another library that we didn't really want them to get trapped by another library and then because the delivery process and the quarantine process is so slow it's not really you know it, it's not fulfilling that original purpose of getting things that are only on the shelf right. at that location. So we're, we're, we're doing some workflow tweaks to try to mitigate that. Um, the other thing, you know, that we discovered is that while it was super fun to ask people for their preferences, like I said, it was a lot of work and our original vision was something more like this really is potluck, you know, 
you might get 10 books and you might hate all of them <laughs> because we're just going to kind of pull some things off the new bookshelf and hopefully you'll find something that when you're you know locked in your house during a pandemic yeah. you might enjoy reading because <laughs> it's something new and different and no you might not have picked it but you know that's how it is yeah um and i feel like you know, staff is becoming busier. We're still not allowed to have very many people in the building. It's harder to do this work and to do it well. So we're trying to implement some tweaks that are gonna make it, that they're still gonna preserve the ability of people to, you know, make some specific requests, but kind of limit the volume of that so that we don't spend as much time doing that and try to shift them more towards kind of a, you know, quick picks model. Like, you know, you don't get to pick which new fiction we're going to give you but you can have more if you just let us randomly grab it you know that mm -hmm. kind of a thing yeah we still aren't quite there yet because there are so many people who have to you know work on that project and of course we're not all in the same building um to do that so it's kind of slow going but yeah and so it's just, so to me that's more of a true csa thing like you know you really might get something that you really don't like, like, you know, beats. Um, right. And you're just, you know, it's okay. Just compost them. It's cool. Yeah. Return it. Give them to your um, neighbor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Um, and the patrons have been responding positively. I know that there's been some local write-ups about it. And um, it just seems like it's, it's caused a, a nice positive buzz for the library locally. One comment a patron made was, I am looking forward to this so much more than picking out my own books, which I, I really got a kick out of that one. I thought that was kind of cool. And that to me, you know, what that says to me is, you know, maybe there's some, some, some potential here for when we're past this pandemic, you know, maybe that's like a regular service we can pro provide, which is, you know, which is a service we've always provided, you know, reader's yeah. advisory, but you know, like it, it doesn't seem quite as modern or as sexy. Um, a library function is, you know, I mean, as maybe some of us who have been around for a while, you know, like to think of as one of our sort of core services, but it would be a cool way to kind of get back to offering that a little more explicitly rather than just somebody standing in front of you saying, what should I read? So, right. Yeah. Yeah. And it almost reminds you too of like a subscription box, which we're also used to these days, right? Where you just yeah. you say, I, this is something I like and surprise me, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I hope it's, it's, um, seems like, you know, as you work through it, there, it could be something great to keep around, you know, once we get back to normal operations, whatever normal means. Um, are, do you have any advice for libraries that are considering offering a service like this? I would say, you know, we, we kind of did this very seat of our pants and we, you know, we made up a lot of it as we went along. <laughs> and I would, I would suggest that people, um, people think think a little bit more, you know, sort of long term about like what you can do and what's sustainable. I think we made the right decision early on to not put limits on how many things people could request, but I sort of wish we had been a, done something a little more in that direction to manage people's expectations. Like people don't realize that if you're asking for 60 books, that, that, that that's hard to do. They also, they didn't realize, and how would they know that we weren't in the location actually pulling them off the shelf? Right. If, if, you, if, you, if you were gonna do something and you couldn't do it, you couldn't staff it by having someone in the location pulling it off the shelf, I would really think long and hard about it because it really, really, really takes so much more time to do it that way and um you know just kind of that librarian feel you have for like this would be a good choice for this person or this wouldn't be a good choice for that person you can get that standing in front of the shelf yeah. you don't get it so much if you're looking at your screen <laughs> and trying to like go through your catalog search results and then yeah. you know yeah then you have to look and make sure it's available at that location and that just that adds a lot of friction to the whole process so I would think, you know, the, the, the best way to do this would be if you had people in the building who could really just grab things. If you want to give people, you know, that amount of choice. Right. I, I would really, you know, like, like I said, if, if I could go back, I would have from the very beginning done just more of a grab bag, mm -hmm. um, which, 
you know, and for reasons that I completely understand and support, the circulation department thought that was going to make the curbside process complicated at the beginning, you know, when they were just trying to figure out how to get people's, you know, existing holds out the door. And they didn't want to add like a new process to that. And I understand it and I respect it, but I wish we could have done it that way from the beginning because it would have been a lot easier to just be able to say, here's some current fiction, here's some, you know, memoirs, here's, you know, here's a bunch of picture books. Um, and I think that would have been really, really helpful in the early days of the pandemic when people really were, they were cooped up, they were locked down, they were desperate for materials. And it would have been nice if we could have had a way to just push more, you know, product out the door in, you know, with, that was maybe more of a blunt instrument instead of trying to like get people exactly what they want. Yeah. Yeah. Those early days were tough. I remember when the library closed, I was like, oh my God, like, that was like when it was like, it really hit me like, this is something that's really happening and I can't get books anymore, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, but I would just encourage people to be really, really like think really long and hard about how, how much specificity you're able to allow people to, um, you know, to provide you with. And if you, you know, if you have the capacity to let them be really, really picky about what they get. I mean, that's great. I mean, that, that that's good for everybody, but I think you have to think about what you can realistically do. And, right. you know, everybody, and, you know, of course, everybody wanted to do a good job. Everybody wanted to give them those 20 perfect books. And, you know, it's just, I, I almost think if we didn't have any of that information that they liked trucks or that, yeah. you know, and Patchett was their favorite author, it would have been easier in some ways <laughs> to yeah. just, kind of throw things at them instead of trying to find things that we thought were really good matches. Yeah. Yeah. There's gotta be like, like a Goldilocks moment of yeah. like, this is the perfect amount of information uh, to find the right book. That's really helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I'm wondering for both of you, um, this whole pandemic experience, I mean, it's just turned everything upside down. What has your experience been like as library professionals? I mean, how, how does this, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure this isn't something you expected to happen um during your your career i'm wondering just like you know how has it shifted things for you as as li library professionals i think for me as a manager it's um it's really increased my awareness even more about the importance of having like policies and procedures and plans in place um because we have short-term emergency plans you know what what do you do if there's a tornado what do you do if there's a fire drill but we don't have like, what do you do if you have to close for eight weeks, you know, and provide no library service to anyone in the city and figure out how to telework from home in a, in a week. You know, we, we had, we just didn't have the, the planning and protocols, I think, in place for something this catastrophic. Um, and neither did our city in a lot of cases. So we just, there was a lot of scrambling. And, you know, I feel like we learned a lot about how to, other and what worked and what didn't. Um, I feel like had we had we maybe done a little more disaster planning up front, we might have been a little more prepared for some of the things that, that came along. Um, anything from, you know, maybe we look at a model of instead of buying desktops for staff, we buy laptops with the assumption that they could take them home much more easily than they could take their entire desktop home. So I think it's really pushed me to think about thinking about things from a, like, oh, this is how they are now, but how might they be differently? You know, how, how might teleworking affect us long-term or how might um, we change some of our policies to be a little more flexible, knowing that, you know, hopefully this will never happen again, but some changes will happen again and, and how can we be better prepared for them? Mm -hmm. Kathy, any thoughts you'd like to share? Oh, oh, there's so much. I mean, everything that Tana said, um, you know, everything that you know or think you know is just turned on its ear and you have to just re-examine all of your assumptions. You know, I said earlier, I'm the interlibrary loan librarian. Well, who boy, you know, <laughs> like everything we did is just like, oh, nope, that doesn't apply anymore. Yeah, can't do that. Yeah, we're going to have to adjust that. And that's been true, you know, throughout the whole resource sharing community, you know, nationwide. Um, I, I've, I've thought a lot about, um, you know, just, just, I mean, equity issues. I mean, I even think this, you know, 
the service that we're here talking about today. It's great. It's wonderful. I'm glad we're doing it. But oh man, you know, it, it serves a very specific segment of our population, you know, people who have the connectivity to go online and fill out a form. And, you know, there are so many, so I, when I talk about the blunt instrument or just pushing things out the door, you know, I wish we had, you know, I mean, hindsight is 2020, of course, I wish we had found a way earlier to kind of figure out like maybe we roll a cart of books out onto the sidewalk and we can, you know, people can just come and grab things, you know, um, there's just, there's, there's so much to consider when we think about a new service and, and there's no way that you're, you know, that you're kind of hitting, you know, everybody. And to me, there's sort of that, um, you know, there's kind of a balancing act between like, you know, the taxpayers who fund what we do who have a lot more privilege, <laughs> you know, and maybe expect a certain amount of service. And then the people who maybe need our services more, who aren't contributing as much funding to what we do, but, and how we, you know, kind of navigate that, that's, you know, that's something I've thought a lot about. Um, and just, you know, the, I think just the frustration of, you know, we, we want to do everything, you know, we want to give people so much. And the reality is, is that we can't do everything and we can't do everything well. So are we gonna to try to do more and you know, understand that there are some compromises involved in doing more? Or are we gonna go, you know, let's just focus on these things and try to do them you know, as well as we can. And I don't think there's a right answer to that question. Um, but just when I sort of think about how do I spend my time and how do I navigate things and you know, how do I prioritize what I do? Those are some of the kind of the things I struggle with, so. Yeah, that's really great. I think that could be applied to everybody. <laughs> like, I mean, what are, like, we just, we've all had to be really clear about what our purpose is and, and you know, um, I, I just got a lot of, from what you said, uh, and I'm not a, a librarian, unfortunately, but I, but I can totally apply that to, to my personal and professional lives these days. Um, thank you both so, so much. I've got one last question for you. Um, so there have been, you know, so many challenges during this time. But I do think there are some bright spots and some silver linings um, that we can hold on to. And I'm wondering um, if you could share maybe one particular bright spot for you, um, you know, where you see some, some positive hope or outcome for you, the library, or, or the greater community. I think I'll build off of what Kathy had said earlier about, about equity. Um, I feel like we have made some pretty big strides um, in terms of getting all of our staff on maybe a more even playing field in terms of just understanding what implicit bias is and how it how equity issues affect library work you know one of the things that we did when um, we closed and really were offering very little service for about eight weeks is all of the staff in the organization or most of the staff in the organization that were working um, had the opportunity to do a lot more professional development and training. And we did a lot of, we offered a lot of equity-based um, opportunities. So we had book discussion groups and um, video trainings and, you know, some other services that we were able to provide to all levels of staff in our organization. Um, we've really focused on community engagement a lot in the last few years, but most of that work is, is being done by professional librarians or um, other staff who have been hired to specifically do that work. And that has not always trickled down into all levels of our organization. So having the time to really dig into some of those things and then, you know, the unfortunate reinforcement of how important it was when protests started happening in our community and across the nation um, really gave us the time, I think, to, to dig into some of those issues a little more. We have a racial equity change team now that's doing a lot of different work. They're starting affinity groups for staff of color. They've made um, recommendations, basically, like they gave us a list of, of things that we should do, anything from small level changes to like lobby for statewide changes. Um, we also recently last week went fine free. So um, we saw that as a big equity issue. And now there's one less barrier to using the public library. Um, so I feel like we've made some changes in, in that regard that maybe would have taken quite a bit longer to happen if we had been in a regular work environment. Yeah, that's wonderful. 
seizing the opportunity for positive change. Yeah. I think, you know, one thing that's been, um, you know, kind of a bright spot for me is just sort of um, being reminded how much, um, you know, how, how much the collection and the materials are important to our patrons, you know, I mean, just the, how th some of the comments they've made about, you know, being able to pick up their holds and, and the, um, the service that we've been providing, you know, we, I think we sometimes get, you know, caught up in our digital services and, you know, overdrive, you know, which, which is great if you're an ebook person. I'm not an ebook person, I have to say, but, you know, but a lot of people are. Yay, I'm glad we can provide that. Um, but there's still a lot of people who, um, who really want those physical materials. And, you know, that's, an, that's still an important um, thing for people vis-a-vis -vis libraries and you know it's you know it, it's it's fashionable to say well libraries are more than just books and of course they are but the books are still important to people and the dvds are still important to people and um it's just been kind of a nice reminder that that actually is true yeah yeah, I yeah and i think the fact that we you know the first service we offered when we opened was getting books right <laughs> A nice reminder that books are really important. And, you know, to Kathy's point, um, we've seen a lot of physical materials go out, but we've also seen a tripling in the use of our online um, book collection. So that has been a really unique opportunity to market that in, you know, that often gets lost in all the other programs and services that we're offering. But um, to really highlight, you know, when you're closed and, and this is the only way that you can get books, we were able to um, start an online library card process, which is something we talked about for years. We did it in, what, three weeks? Um, and we're able to get people signed up to, to um, access the library and to learn how to use the ebook collection. But, you know, still also getting lots and lots of physical materials out the door. So wonderful. Um, yeah. Equals are such a shiny example of all the awesome innovative work that libraries are doing all the time, but especially during a pandemic. Um, so thank you so much for being part of this webcast today. I'm so, so honored to have you as guests and we're so um, excited to share your story with the broader audience. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you.